Okay, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to this webinar of the Council for Disabled Children. Uh, this webinar is on joint working and integration around special education needs and disabilities and uh, sharing the learning from our regional events. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and we will share the slides with you all as well. Um, there will be uh, time for questions at the end of this webinar, so we encourage you to type down any questions you may have on the chat box that should appear on your screen. Okay. Regarding the agenda, we will have three presentations today. Uh, first, we are going to talk about joint working for quality improvement and integration around special education needs and disabilities and lesson learned, followed by a presentation from Gary Joyce, Julie Woodless, and Sarah Dolan doing it differently, the sentiments neurodevelopment of pathway. And finally, Lini Chapman and Sam Teller will speak about therapies in school projects, bringing therapies into the heart of schools. For now, let me pass on to Sarah Hart and Anna Gardiner, who will be talking about drone working for quality improvement and integration around SEND. Over to you. Hi, everyone. It's Anna Gardiner from CDC here. Uh, Sarah and I are just going to run through quite quickly some of the lessons that we learned from the events that we've done uh, before we hand over to Gary and everyone else in St. Helens. Uh, so, we have so far done eight of nine events, one more is still to happen next month in the South West. Um, it's part of our DfE contract around integration and joint working, so events for local authorities, for CCG partners um, and, and parent care forums to understand a bit more about the integration agenda um, and get some kind of key updates from partners, so NMPCF, NHS England, uh, the Transforming Care Programme and, and the regional SEND networks have all done uh, slots at the events and we've always had one or two examples of, of good practice, effective practice, um, which is what you're going to hear more about today um, and sessions for discussion and action planning. So when we've done the last event next month, we'll um, we'll build together a kind of learning summary and we'll share that so you'll get an idea about the, the kind of learning from each of the events uh, through that as well. So each of the uh, regional joint working events, uh, we did start off by having a quick recap on why we need to focus on joint working. Again, we're just going to run through this really quickly. I'm sure it's old news for most of you, um, but just as a reminder to frame the rest of the webinar. Uh, so why we need to focus on joint working? Firstly, we all know that it makes sense. We know that children and young people with SEND and their families and children and young people without SEND, everybody has a complex life um, and that their needs cross the traditional service boundaries. Um, and we also know that children and young people with SEND are more likely to belong to other groups that need support. Uh, the policy context, we know, put certain duties on local authorities and their partners around joint working, so most notably the Children and Families Act around SEND. And the financial context at the moment, um, which might seem to make joint working much more difficult and does in many cases make joint working much more difficult. Um, also uh, does have the potential to push people to be innovative and to make decisions um, that might reduce pressures on families and professionals. So we know that integration, although it's something really tricky uh, to get in place, can actually potentially reduce some of those financial pressures in the end. So this slide is one that we showed at each of these regional events. Um, and we thought we'd just include it here. I'm not going to go through it in a huge amount of detail because you will get the slides and today is more about hearing um, from the different best practice examples. But essentially this is just an illustration of the different overlaps between children and young people with SEND and other groups that need support. So you can see here um, uh, looked after children and young offenders and actually if you look at the uh, box on the far right of the screen, we know that uh, young offenders are more likely to have a special education need or disability. Um, so we've got around uh, 60 to 90 percent of young offenders possibly having a communication disorder. So some really high figures there. It really illustrates the need for the system to work together beyond just health, education and social care um, and other partners as well. So the next slide we've got just shows where we've got all of that data from. It's um, it's not perfect, it's very difficult to get a really accurate picture, um, so a lot of the stats on that previous slide uh, just come from reports and studies done as a, as a one-off. Some of it is national data, 
Um, <clears throat> but if anyone's interested in looking more closely at the figures, all of this information will be included in the slide pack. So just thinking briefly about um, what was working well or what we heard about through the course of these eight regional events we've had so far um, that really uh, that really struck us as something really positive going on and came through as a key theme. So we were hearing again and again um, about instances where early intervention and the use of a graduated approach um, was really effective. So for example, we heard from West Berkshire about um, the, their Emotional Health Academy where they've uh, used low intensity support and a graduated approach to ensure that children and young people in West Berkshire um, receive the support they need with their emotional health. So that's through from sort of work within, within mainstream schools all the way through to more intensive support, um, for example, in people with growing units. And then um, thinking about starting in the earliest years. So we heard from uh, Northamptonshire about their specialist and support services and, um, and effectively they've integrated a few teams to really focus and provide a really comprehensive support package from the earliest years. We also heard a lot about the benefits of sharing resources and expertise locally. So in Lincolnshire, there's been a lot of collaboration between different special schools. The aim of that is to eventually deliver support closer to home and placements closer to home for children and young people who need them. Um, and we also heard a lot about building skills and knowledge in universal settings. Um, so, for example, uh, we know Lenny and Sam will be talking a bit later on this webinar about therapies in schools. Um, but we also heard from uh, the whole School Send programme in London talking about providing training for teachers and staff within mainstream schools so that they can ensure that children and young people with Send are receiving the support that they need. So we also um, heard a lot about developing shared outcomes and strategy as being a really uh, key cornerstone of getting this right. So <clears throat> a lot of you may have heard already about Hertfordshire's Outcome Bs. We have a case study on this on our website. Essentially, um, they developed a uh, shared outcomes framework across education, health and social care um, for all children and young people in Hertfordshire. Um, and Bedford is doing something quite similar, so they're developing their own shared outcomes framework. And the aim ultimately is to use those outcomes to monitor their progress at the strategic level and also I think individual level as well. We will actually, um, on the 21st of February, be holding another of these webinars. The input from us will be the same, um, but somebody from Bedford will be speaking about their work. So if anyone's interested in joining that, we will share details of that after this webinar as well. Um, and we also heard a lot about meaningful co-production and participation. Obviously, it's important that this is meaningful and it's not token. Um, but where local areas had done something really effective and got something right, they had always included um, families, uh, for example, parent care forums as well, from the very start, um, and young people's groups. So we'll be hearing from St Helens in a moment, but we know that they involve their parent care reform from the very beginning. Um, and also we heard from Rotherham uh, about the Rotherham Charter that was developed. That's a set of principles that was developed with parents, families, children, young people um, from the very beginning. We also heard from Suffolk about empowering young people's groups. So the Suffolk Young Person, Young Persons Network uh, is involved in uh, designing and developing SEND services locally. So it's just Anna again. Uh, briefly, a few of the things that have come up that we think we get to focus on uh, into the next year. So we're fortunate enough to know that we'll have this contract uh, from April onwards, which uh, we think is really good news. It means that some of the, the things we've been working on, we can, we can continue. Um, developing. So a few of the things that came up at the events um, consistently, lots of, of discussion as Sarah's just mentioned around the data we know around uh, young offenders, but that link, those links with the youth justice system uh, in some areas are quite well established and others not so much, so something that we might want to, to think about more. Uh, inclusion and, and by default exclusion, obviously a real hot topic. Um, again, the um, Edward Timpson's exclusions report is due out soon, so we, we and we'll await that um, eagerly. And a lot of conversation, um, very much linked to the Transforming Care Programme, but around identifying and supporting children and young people who have autism only and no learning difficulty or disability. So that, that's a focus that we think we might have um, in the next year or so. 
a few of the uh, the kind of national things that are ongoing. So Christine Lenehan, our director at CDC, uh, in her review last year in residential special schools and colleges, she recommended that there be a cross-government uh, national send leadership board. So that has um, work has started there. There is um, an official who's who's working at the DfE to set that up. Uh, we think the meeting will be the first meeting will be soon. Uh, but essentially, the focus of that board will be joint commissioning and joint working across agencies uh, nationally, but also think about what that looks like locally too. So we we're really keen to see what that uh, board discusses and recommends. The NHS long term plan, which came out last week, we have a blog on our, our the CDC website if anyone's interested to know a bit more about what that means for children, young people with SEND. But a few of the highlights um, talks about a key worker role for young people with learning disabilities and autism, uh, talks a lot about expanded mental health services and support, uh, some information and training for the, the health workforce around learning disability and autism, uh, lots more around those new. Uh, commissioning footprints, thinking about integrated care providers and ICS accountability performance framework. Um, so again, lots, lots of work uh, suggested that work to happen that we keep an eye on. Uh, some changes to the Ofsted schools framework and the exclusions review that I mentioned that Edward Timpson has has written will be out soon. Uh, obviously, we know that send inspections, local area inspections are ongoing, but that now CQC and Ofsted are doing revisits to areas that have had a previous written statement of action. We know that they've already been to a couple of those areas, um, so we'll start to understand what those revisits look like and what they mean for the areas. Uh, and in the autumn this year, the autism review strategy uh, will be refreshed and will include children and young people. Uh, a few things that um, are ongoing that you probably know about. We have this contract, which means we can offer support to local areas. So we have some audit tools at these regional events that we're talking about. We have local support to, to areas. Uh, prioritise those with a written statement of action, but we do have days that we can support other areas, either pre or, or after inspection, but no written statement of action. We have our designated medical and clinical officer forum too, and a new children's commissioners forum, which um, is just kind of starting to get underway and some really interesting conversations and a couple of surveys that um, are open at the moment that we'd really like your help on as well. Um, and all of this, as ever, is on our website. You can see it all there and we'll make sure that you get the, the link to that with the slides. Thank you very much, Anna and Sarah. And um, now let me pass on to Gary Joyce, Julie Willis and Sarah Delight for the presentation on Sentinel Neurodevelopment Pathway. Over to you. Oh. Oh, Julie, Gary, and Sarah, can you hear us? Sorry, just bear with us, technical issues. Sorry for this uh, technical difficulty. We will move directly on. Oh, Julie, uh, is that you? Do you hear us? Oh. Uh, we will directly move on to our last presentation on therapies at school until we can figure out the, this presentation. Um, oh, do you want to get? Yeah, thank you. Right, um, we're just going to introduce ourselves first. We have some slides. I, my name is um, Sam Taylor, and I'm the assistant head at um, Merritt Building Secondary School in Worthing, which is in West Sussex. And I'm Linny Chapman, one of the occupational therapists working on the Therapy in Schools project. Okay, brilliant. If we can go to the first slide. Oh, do we do that? No. 
Thanks. Um, what we were looking at um, when we was first looking um, at putting a project like this together, um, sitting when we were planning it, um, street planning it, what the basics of it was looking at tribunals and we we're looking at why within West Sussex we were losing so many tribunals, especially for our more complex young people. And looking at that, it was due to therapeutic input. So, and within that, non maintained schools are able to sell packages of all the therapies they offer in house, even if that's just 20 hours and how it's broke up into paperwork, you know, it doesn't matter, they're still selling an offer. So, we needed to compete with that in this present world to keep our young people in their local schools. Um, what we're doing, and, and our, my school being a particular example, is we we're having to use private therapies to plug that gap a lot, which was costing a lot of money and wasn't always consistent. The therapists didn't know the young people, that they weren't working in that consistent way within the classrooms and that. So, um, as I said, yeah, I didn't have knowledge. And also their links with the parents were very limited. And as we know, with um, send young people, any young people, it's working with the parents, engaging the parents, family is crucial. Um, the NH, um, also, we have a very good relationship with our NH therapies who work in the school and do clinics in the school, but they felt like they were just fire fighting, you know, and they weren't able to choose how they delivered it to the people's needs. You know, they were given a very clear directive and had to keep to that and it didn't allow them to work sometimes in any really in-depth way. So they were always, the therapists at this school have always been, NHS have always been really supportive. Um, and basically at the end of the day we were not meeting the needs of our students and families and you know looking at the HCPs and documents like that that was true so we needed to move forward and make sure we did next slide so it is family and we do look at it as a family a very holistic thing so obviously uh, all the work that um, therapies and schools do it has the child at the center um, and so we're looking at who is involved in that because it's a holistic approach in 24 hour 365 day a year. So obviously the parent and carer who know that child incredibly well, engaging them, obviously you've got the Senko or um, the person in that school that oversees the therapies, the therapy manager. Um, we in each school, which Lynn will go into the training a little bit, we are looking at having, we will have champions in each area of our training so they can be the link between the therapists and the school as well as working with therapists and working classrooms. Obviously, we needed you have know, the therapists that work with them, both NHS and therapies in schools, and obviously the teachers and the support staff. Next slide. OK, <clears throat> so when we were looking at what the schools needed in order to look as brilliant as our non-maintained competition, as it were, um, one of the things we really felt we needed to bring on board was a training package that we could set us above everything else and sort of empower the education staff to deliver therapeutic um, goals and things within the curriculum and within the classroom and that they felt confident to do because part of the beginning aspect of our TIS project was to, to talk to the teachers and the education staff and say well, what is it what's the what's the problem what is it that you feel you you can't do from a therapeutic matter and they just didn't feel they had the skills or the confidence to deliver um, perhaps what some of the NHS staff had gone in and said was needed and then gone out again. So we put in place this modular training um, which is in the process of being accredited and it's kind of three three pronged and pre-tiered if you see what I mean. So we have three areas, we have physical support, which is delivered by our physiotherapist. We have sensory processing area, which is delivered by an occupational therapist, myself. And then we have the life skills stream, which is delivered by another occupational therapist. And we've broken that into tiers. So level one is our basic foundational level, which we are saying that all education staff now will need to go through within six months of employment. So that's their basic foundational skills and that gives them the basic skills they need to work therapeutically within the classroom and combine that with the curriculum needs. And then they can go on if they're selected by their peers, their teachers on their show interest to do a level two, which is slightly more in depth knowledge and then level three enables them to become a TIS accredited champion and that almost makes them a, a therapy assistant type role they have more in-depth knowledge and they can do some of the troubleshooting that we might have seen coming in for referrals they can um, 
assist their peers and their colleagues and say okay I've got this sensory problem and um, can you give me some support or advice before it needs to come to a therapist so it, it kind of wheedles out perhaps some of the work that we felt that the education staff should be able to do but they just didn't have the confidence to do okay so if we could go on to the next slide please okay so the at the moment the TIS project was for three schools um, and we delivered that across all of those schools during some interest in set days part of the project um, the project run for 18 months is just beginning to finish now we've trained over 200 staff uh, level two rolled out it has rolled out now on the 23rd of november and we've done 60 staff across those three schools um, and they've all been given a workbook to go through with certificates and um, they've all been evaluated to see how how the training affected them and how they confidence levels have, have grown and they've all given really good positive feedback. The feedback has been brilliant even just walking around the school you can see it in practice in the classrooms. Okay next slide please. This is you Sam. Okay um, oh. yeah since training obviously as you said um, we just observed prison strategies in place in the classrooms um, and the feedback from the staff all of our staff is absolutely fantastic on this and we, we had another um, day where we had surgeries with sort of Ed Sykes and that coming in. And one of the feedback we got from them was how much more empowered our staff was. And when they went to talk to them about um, students, it was amazing. They didn't go saying, I don't know what to do. They said, I've tried this, I've tried this, and I've tried this. And now I'd like some support in where I go next. So that was a really good feedback from another thing that showed us that. Um, also, just we just had Ofsted in, and officially can't say anything but they did mention um, therapies in the classroom and that therapeutic input, which was great. Um, also, it's just increasing the number of inappropriate or unnecessarily referrals to NHS, you know, because that was just straight go to, can I have a referral form? Can I do that? Or when the physio's in, can you talk to them about this? And that has just naturally just dropped off because again, they're confident and, you know, they know what they're doing. Um, and they can have those conversations both with home and with other staff as well. Um, yeah, increasing staff troubleshooting independently to seek their own solutions, which is great. Um, even bringing stuff to us, like I found this, I've seen this. Um, an increase in understanding of the roles of occupational therapists and physiotherapists which is very true because now they are able to separate those much mm. more and ask for support or when they go to surgeries they know which ones to access um what's been brilliant from a school point of view is also therapists are spending the time in the classrooms that's where it is so like whether that's just going through physio programs or looking at postural passports or um, water skills, which is another big part, or going up to do a life a life skill session for a block of six weeks with a you know a, a very sensory SLD class. They're working the class and that training and that understanding is happening all the time. And also what the students are learning and doing for their goals is really beneficial to their independence and moving them on it ultimately to adult transition. Um, yeah, and it's just, it's just supporting staff to embed therapy games curriculum and staff really feel that that's happening. Okay, next slide please. So other than the, the, um, the tier training is our, our bulk of what the therapies in school is all about, but in, on top of that we're doing a water skills programme which involves screening for health screening to check that the children that are being taken into the pool, it is appropriate for them to be in the pool from a physical and medical point of view. Um, we've worked, the physiotherapist and the occupational therapist have worked together to create posture passports for complex disability so that the teaching staff and education staff in class know how to position um, those children effectively and, and safely and just build their confidence. And I think those go with them wherever they go, whether they need a hospital visit or something, those passports are with them all the time. And they're, they're, they're a lot of photos, a lot of instructions, they're very clear and concise to follow. So they go with that student everywhere they mm. go. And transition the from mm. primary to secondary, it helps that transition, um, which is we've never had before. Um, so the sensory screening pilot um, was a pilot within the pilot where we when new children came into the primary schools, um, we 
sent the parents some um, uh, sensory screening forms to look at what sensory needs might be coming into the school and then we observed those children within the school and then helped the classroom teachers look at sensory support plans and and how to engage with their sensory needs and again that's something that's never happened before just because within the NHS it wasn't possible they don't have the capacity to do that so these are additional services that TIDS was able to put in um, to support to for the teachers to embed their goals within their holistic curriculum so we're working with the teachers now about goal setting and how to combine everyday school activities with helping therapeutic goals and just working together. Um, the TIF surgeries are, we're looking at four term now. This will be where an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist will be here after school for a couple of hours and education staff can book in a slot if they just want to come and chat about a particular student or a session or anything. They just want to get advice on they can come and talk to us um, and therapists are now attending path meetings annual reviews staff meetings um, as part of the children on their caseload and I think one of the things is we the therapists have become part of the school family so we can contribute to newsletters contribute to the working life of school whereas before this this pilot came into place it was very much uh, the NHS came in recommended something and went away and no disrespect to them they're they're brilliant but that's that's all they could do um, because of the restrictions they have on their capacity. So it's really nice to have therapists that are actually based within the school and become part of the school family. And I think that really helps when you're um, trying to promote the, the ability to just come and chat and get advice when you want to, somebody you know, someone you recognise. So we're there at parents' evenings, which is great. Parents can see us, which really promotes that we're here from a stopping tribunals and point of view that that we can say yep we're here we're here supporting your children in school there is therapeutic input and it's it's working um sensory circuits training and alert program there's all, all other things that we're doing as well okay if we could move to the next slide please uh, so this is just one of the comments that came from a teacher at one of our school and um, we probably haven't got time to go through it so if we it just talks about collaborative working and how sharing goals has been a really positive impact for that teacher. If we could click onto the next slide, please. Okay, so we've spoken a little bit about this, um, but the supporting carers and families was really vital because we want the parents and families to really know that we're there for them and that we are part of the school and we can help them. And it we want to kind of join the dots really between the school the parents and carers and the nhs and all those other agencies so we kind of have to become one big family so we're there for attendance and meetings we're doing home visits um, throughout the year we're helping them in transitions we're setting goals with the family and the therapists and the education staff jointly and also one of the other things that has been really positive is we've offered parents the same level one training that we're giving all the staff. So we hold it away from the schools in, an, in another uh, room, um, in another building, and they can come along and actually receive the same training. So they're learning what we learn. And that kind of joins up the dots so that we're all doing the same thing, home and school. Um, and that dialogue between home and school becomes so much more student fo focused on that mm. young person speaking the same language I think as well which really helps um, flexible in our communication we're linked with the parent care reformer who've been so supportive it's been fantastic um, yeah and it's been about building confidence of the parents in the school's ability to competently meet the children's therapeutic needs okay if we just click through please okay that was a parent felt that who went on the training that's them um, their feedback Okay, we can click pass, please. <clears throat> um, yeah, so obviously it was looking at therapists in school and NHS and schools working together. There's that collaborative working, um, and it and it does. And the, and the therapies in schools enables, as a school, us to prioritise those children for the caseload that we see around the school or, or notice that the NHS aren't necessarily working with or working with a in in with a different way um in terms you know of our more complex needs that might just be um, a young person who's come back after a long 
uh, after a long holiday, one of my school breaks, and need to fit a physio input because they haven't had the capacity maybe to do the physio that that young person needs at home, through to where our knowledge of a centre integration or um, it is developing where we notice that maybe there is a sensory element input that's needed so they're able to work in those ways. Um, there, if a child is on the NHS load, that doesn't mean that um, TIS can't at all work with them. We've had a lot of really good collaborative working um, with our physios here, our OTs, and our speech and language therapists as well, so that uh, as that can complement and support the current plans. But they don't take that child on necessarily onto their caseload, but there are times when working in partnership is really beneficial and it's done really well. I mean, it's all our therapists. The TIS and the NHS, we're all based in the same area of the school. So there's a lot of informal communication as well. So we, we work really hard at building that kind of environment. Um, office, also, from a full point of view, it's great. TIS offers ad hoc and flexible support and available. I mean, we could pop in and go, Linny, just got this, this little thing to unstick, or can you just nip up and see this young person and see how it's in the classroom? So they'll pop in and have a look at that or someone will just come down to this area and have just a one question is this bit of equipment or um, I've tried this strategy so they can drop in and out ad hoc and that's um, well um, one thing we do do is the caseload though what is actually a caseload they're working with we do cap it and it, and it, and it stays capped because even now it'd be inundated that they'd be drowning and then be firefighting <laughs> a bit like the NHS if, if we allowed that to free reign so there is you know we're quite good at keeping quite tight deadlines or uh, you know from my point of view I make sure that everyone sort of lets me know in teaching staff if they want to go to therapists otherwise they would be undated um, and lays and support with social services where needed and that's where it's well especially in our multidisciplinary team meetings TAFs coming together and um, talking in, in in that way and supporting the families in the community and at home is often in partnership with social care as well. I think also that it's worked with, because we're not part of the NHS team as such, mm. we can go a little bit off, off piste, if that's the right phrase, and that the social services, social worker might come to me and say, oh, we just need that extra bit of work with this child about communication or something. Um, I know it's not your remit, but could you possibly go and do it? And yes, we'll go home, we'll create communication and time boards um, and, and do that where needed. So we can be really flexible and help other services and just kind of join up the dots really, whereas it might have been before, well, that's not my role, that's more, that's, you know, we can just be a little bit more flexible, which has been fantastic. But yeah, you've got the ability to be that because of... It, it, you know you're working under the school tech, you know under school governance so it's working really in that way and that gives that flexibility which in fact many NHS therapists have comment on that you know they really respect that flexibility and it's a really good way to work we have the next slide please <clears throat> okay shall I do yeah okay so um the future it is the future We've just been part of the 18 month contract and that actually finishes next month as a as a pilot. Um, we've just been really fortunate to have the funding agreed now that we are rolling it out across the county. So it was just three schools in a specialised area of just in Worthing down here in Sussex. And we're now spreading it across the whole of West Sussex. That's our plan, um, which is really exciting. It's fantastic. <laughs> so it's been really successful. The confidence parentally has improved. Um, we have seen a drop in tribunals mm -hmm. going forward and the money that that has saved the, the local authority is fantastic. It will pay for the TIS service, which so it just makes sense. Um, we're going to continue to support the staff to do their training. The modular training is hopefully going to become entrenched into the schools and mandatory training. And we really hope that the schools across the county will really get on board. Um, We've worked hard to build unity between the NHS and external agencies so that we all kind of know what we're doing um, and be flexible within that. Uh, so yeah, I say it's potential to roll out, it's going to be now. Yeah. Um, we're also looking at selling the training further on so that we can build some funding to do more really. Um, it's in the process of getting its accreditation and when it has, we can then go to other schools um, in different counties or mainstream schools here and say, this is the package that tiers can give you. Um, you may not have the full tiers, but you might have tiers that is just 
the training, the, the modular training for your education staff. And we really hope people will take that on board. We really hope that we can use aspects of that to work with schools that don't just have special educational mm -hmm. needs, that they have um, mainstream schools that we can um, maybe just a sensory training package in a school might help some of those children that are in mainstream schools with ADHD, autism. We can build on it and help that side of things. So there's lots of places for this to go in the future. Um, and that's that's it really. That's yeah. where we are. That's where we are. Thank um, you. Yeah, that's it. So if you want to go to the next slide, but I think we're we're Thank there. you for listening. <laughs>
choose. We told them how much money we wanted to spend and left it up to the potential providers to come up with the solutions around how they would deliver help in St. Helens. Our procurement people at the time really hated this idea because it went against all the rules that they were used to dealing with. However, what it did do, it gave us two services that families could access from day one at point of referral to the pathway to support them while they were going through the process of the what was the autism pathway, which now changed the neuro pathway. The neuro pathway fun coordination function, we moved out of the local authority cited it with one of the NHS providers and enhanced it slightly to provide clinical lead function as well and that was established fully in May 2017. Can we move on to the next slide please? While we were doing the development of the pathway the governance arrangements we put in place a multi-agency stakeholder group and I've listed all the different groups that were involved in this panel. This was a two-year process because as you can see we had a lot of different organisations involved from day one and this was around being able to identify exactly what processes we need to follow, making sure that all the services that were going to be involved in the neuro pathway were there from day one, following exactly what parents were looking at in relation to changes that they needed to make well basically to support them through the process and we met for that two-year period every couple of months and we had a fully developed project plan and each phase was approved by the stakeholder group with buying from all the stakeholders that pushed forward the way we were going to work I'll now hand over to Sarah, who will give a parent's viewpoint in relation to this two-year process that we followed. Hi, yeah, I sat with, along with another parent rep on the neurodevelopmental steering group uh, right from the beginning. Um, and I just really want to go over where we were. Um, and some of this I'll repeat what Gary said, but yeah, we had an autism pathway and an ADHD pathway. Um, our autism pathway was very reliant on school referring and this was very difficult for families where children didn't necessarily display in school. Um, the waiting times, yeah, can you change the slide please? Um, the waiting time from referral to diagnosis or non-diagnosis could take up to three years and we actually had triage periods of up to 10 months. Uh, where families are waiting to find out whether they've been accepted onto the pathway. Um, as Gary said, there was little info or support until you got the diagnosis. Um, and the services that were involved um, doing assessments didn't work together. The communication to families um, and also between services was poor. And the coordination function was not very well managed and supported. As a forum, we were hearing constantly from desperate families about the long waiting times, the lack of support and the poor communication. They just didn't know where they were on the pathway. Um, at the time, as a forum, we were developing a really good relationship with our local authority and St. Helens Clinical Commissioning Group. And we all agreed that this was an area that we needed to prioritise. So again, how did we get to where we are now? Uh, we all agreed that the new pathway would be a neurodevelopmental pathway covering a wider range of conditions. Um, we had a great commitment from all the stakeholders. It was a multidisciplinary team. And again, we met every other month. And alongside that, a number of work streams were developed away from the steering group to focus on issues that we needed to take forward. Uh, we all agreed that we needed to meet the needs of children, young people and their families at the earliest stage and throughout, regardless of the diagnosis or non-diagnosis. So this led to a pathway that offered support and information pre, during and post-diagnosis or non-diagnosis. Uh, we knew that parent carers and their families felt let down and didn't know where they were on the pathway. Um, and we recognised that this was key and we needed to improve this as soon as possible. We also recognised the complexity of the pathway and the need for clear processes and records. And as well as looking at where we wanted to be with the new pathway, we couldn't forget those who were currently on the old pathway. 
and getting them through as quickly as possible. It was key that all the stakeholders were honest, listened to each other and respected each other. We did have difficulties. Um, it hasn't always been easy. And as a parent care of forum, um, ourselves and our members had high but not unreasonable expectations. Um, at times we did feel like we wouldn't get there, but we knew that all those around the table were as committed to meeting the needs of children and young people and their families as we were. And we had to keep feeding back to our forum members that, you know, this is what's going on uh, and you'll soon see the difference. Um, and slowly but surely they could see the changes being made and the impact of their involvement. Um, so what were the challenges? Um, it was getting the right people around the table and the consistency in those attending. Um, another challenge was establishing the state of the existing cases on the pathway um, and getting our heads around the fact that we needed to be needs focused rather than diagnosis focused. So where are we now? We have a pathway that supports children, young people and their families from the early stages to diagnosis and beyond. Um, this includes services provided by um, the two newer commission services, Advanced Solutions and our Sunflower Training Programme. As a forum, Listen for Change uh, produced information which given, is given out to parents uh, when they're referred onto the pathway um, and it doesn't, it informs but doesn't overload. Um, the pathway now is well coordinated and communication is excellent and to put it simply, families know if they ring up somebody's going to answer the phone and get back to them and tell them exactly where they are on that pathway. Uh, the timescales for the pathway have come down um, and our forum members can see the impact um, that this is having on families and how they're supported. And we have a pathway that values the views um, and the information from the parents and families as much as the information that comes from the practitioners. Um, however, we're not complacent and we've since set up an oversight group and we have a parent rep on that group um, as we want to continue that our pathway continu continues to meet the needs of all our families. Okay, so if we can just move the slide down, I'm going to finish off by talking about the implementation phase and just trying to bring to life exactly what steps happened um, to make the difference that you're hearing about. So um, the first thing was to establish a coordination team, a new coordination team. This was placed within uh, one of our providers within Northwest Boroughs, our mental health um, foundation trust provider. And it consisted of a clinical lead who was an LD nurse by background with a master's in autism. And she was supported by a pathway coordinator and an administrator. And the initial challenge, as you can imagine, was to fully identify all of those who've been accepted onto the pathway and then to put simple but streamlined processes in place to work through the backlog as quickly and safely as possible and um, that was our priority this involved goodwill um, from ser services already involved in the pathway so without any additional resources they were encouraged to um, offer additional assessments panel sessions and feedback appointments and it really encouraged that team to work together as a pathway um, team so several services together rather than individual services at that time we also further skilled up our workforce by providing additional training so there were additional um, ADOS trainers available so that that could be um, delivered as part of the coordinated assessment when it was required and also some hand and more than words training. So again, we could support, put support in for parents as soon as needs were identified rather than um, it suddenly being after diagnosis, which opened up support, which had previously really been um, what was happening. We completely reviewed the documentation, which was very complicated and hard to navigate and developed a new referral form in conjunction with um, a, a panel of three or four SENCOs who then went out to trial it in their schools um, and also advised leaflets with parents and then we um, redeveloped the structured feedback uh, reports at the end of the process whether there was a diagnosis or not with a whole uh, variety of professionals involved in that as well and at the same time as that um, and clearing the backlog the, and the vision was very much on transforming the pathway from an autism only pathway to one that would coordinate a range um, the diagnosis of a, a range of um, developmental conditions if we can move on to the next slide because we had all the right people around the table so that it should be um, that 
those professionals were able to um, really get to know a whole child and make multiple diagnoses if it was needed. Um, and so they looked at diagnoses such as autism, ADHD, general developmental delay, attachment difficulties, developmental language disorder, social communication disorder, and more recently occupational therapy have become involved in the pathway. So we're looking at developmental coordination disorder as well. There continue to be ongoing monthly panels for early years and school age, which we separated, but with increased capacity. So with the streamlined processes, our panels now can consider um, up to 20 cases per day with everybody around the table to make those decisions. So we've just built the capacity to be able to um, move children through the pathway to a diagnosis or not um, with more efficiency, really. And feedback sessions to be delivered when things are working well within a fortnight of the panel decision. And if we can move on just to the final slide, I think that I've got. I think I've got two actually. Um, so if we could just have a look, because this is what the model looks like. And the focus is very much on what you can see as, as well, it's become known as the bubble. So it sits just to the right of, um, of centre. That's the main focus. This is the offer of help and support, and it's available right from the identification of need throughout the diagnostic process and following the process so that the emphasis has been shifted to the left and it's not all about getting the diagnosis and that offers um, that help for you. Um, and that's, that's working really well. And so just to the final stage, the other part of that model shows the diagnostic process. What happens now is that a referral is received and it's triaged by a weekly multi-agency team and at that point, it might well be redirected to a different service. So we've consciously been trying to pick out children who potentially might have a developmental language disorder, and that they need to go back to speech and language therapy and have a full assessment and possibly some interventions there, rather than it, it go through the neurodevelopmental pathway. But then there's a coordinated assessment. There's a focus on ongoing communication with families throughout the process so they're not left in the dark. Our families said to us, if there's a problem and a delay, we can deal with it if you tell us about it. But if we don't hear from you, we just increase our anxieties and get increasingly angry as well. And we've learned from that. We really listen to that. Uh, there's ongoing support, as you've heard, throughout the pathway process. And we continue to have multi, uh, monthly multi-agency panels for early years and school age where those multiple diagnoses are considered. Um, and we really aim to give prompt feedback following um, panel sessions um, as they occur, um, which is what's summarised on the next slide, which just describes, um, if anybody wants this model, there is an actual supporting um, operational guidance slide that goes with it as well, um, which we can provide for you if you're interested. But that's how the model is currently working. Okay. Okay, we can just jump on to the next slide now. I've just got a couple more that I'm going to quickly go through. Uh, the, the first one is around the, as previously mentioned, we now have a pathway oversight group in place. Now this, the oversight group is predominantly looking at the continued operation of the neuro pathway. It is made up from a number of the original stakeholders that were there developing the pathway. And as Sarah has already said, we have a parent that sits on that, on the oversight group as well. The oversight group is meeting on a regular basis, looking at all the issues that are coming up and, the, and making small changes and looking at the governance arrangements that cover the pathway. What we're also doing as part of the oversight group is we're looking at the performance, we're looking at the numbers of referrals coming in, we're looking at any issues that come up, we're looking at solving those issues as and when they arise, and we're also looking at what further elements we can add to the pathway. Now, just an indication, as we talked earlier, we talked originally around autism pathway, having two, three-year waiting lists. Our average waiting list now is between 20 and 26 weeks. Some are longer, some are shorter, but whenever they are longer, it's because the panel has made a decision that further, further investigations would be necessary. So if I can just jump onto the next slide now in relation to what we've achieved or what we think we've achieved so far. So what we've, what we've achieved is we've put everything in one place. We've got early identification of needs. We've put in place ongoing support services for families and these support services are whether or not a diagnosis is there. We have some families that have accessed support facilities and turned around and said, I don't want to go through the pathway. 
we've had we've shortened the journey time average waiting time as i've just said is now around 26 weeks and we've using using the oversight group using representatives from the parent forum representatives from the different services we've completely redone all the discharge letters which confirm diagnosis or not confirm diagnosis but also as sarah's also said we've redeveloped all the information that passes out to parents originally we had a lot of information that was going out and parents were finding it too unwieldy so we reviewed it all and we still have all that information available but we now have summary of information that goes out initially now i just want to hand over for the final word back to sarah I, uh, yeah so how do we know it's making a difference um gary joyce has come along to our forum meetings for the past three years and up until probably the last year or so the majority of the issues that were raised were around the asd pathway um, at our last forum meeting in november um, when gary asked if there were any issues or questions we had silence uh, and then one member raised her hand and said she wanted to say thank you and um, she's had two children one who's gone through the old pathway one who's gone through the new pathway and like she said, it was a completely different experience and she wanted to say thank you for the changes that we've made. Um, and as a per occur forum, the sign of success for us is our feedback from our families. And where once we were overwhelmed by the number of families feeling let down, we now have thank yous. Um, and by we, I mean all those who have developed and worked hard to um, for our new neuro neurodevelopmental pathway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's our presentation finished. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. Uh, now this is time for questions. So, so far we have uh, one that came up. Uh, if you have any question, please type it in the um, chat box or the question box that should appear on your screen. Uh, so at the moment we have one which is what was the cost of the TIS pilot? How much have TIS got rolled out? Um, I need to unmute you. One second, please. Okay. Over Hi, to you, um, yes. What we did with initial, we looked at what um, would need across the three pilot schools, and with ongoing costs, initially we had about ninety-two thousand pounds. That was for three, um, well, three part-time therapists that made up one point six therapists altogether across the three schools. That was for eighteen months. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, another one is, please can we have the supporting document that give more details on St. Helens NDP and where can we find that? <clears throat> so we will be able to send that out. Um, I believe Gary sent that to me before, so we can share that with everybody who joined the webinar. That's great, thank you. Okay. Any more questions to our panelists? So if you have any questions, please type it directly in the question bar below. We'll give you a couple of minutes to type your questions. Okay, if you have any other questions that will come up after, we will follow up with you directly by email. Thanks to our speakers, that was really, really helpful. And um, thanks for bearing with us on the slight technical issue. We're quite new to webinars, but we feel like that went not too badly. So, and, and really big thanks to both uh, West Sussex and to St. Helens, because that was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes uh, this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. And uh, this session was uh, recorded, and we will share the slides with you all as well. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day.